Amen. You guys doing okay? You sure? Yeah. You sound good. I want to thank all the singers and Duke and Bob for singing for us. Yeah. Doing a great job. Yeah. But amen, amen, amen. See, you guys doing all right, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I know we talked about it earlier, but please keep Noah and the, and the whole family in prayer. So he should be okay. He had an uh, appendectomy this morning. So we're praying about that. Uh, it's only minor surgery when it's not you. You're cutting at me. It's always been a surgery. So, you sure you guys are okay now? I've been, I've been up here for a while, so it's been a while since I preached on Sunday morning. So, I, this is going to be like a nine hour sermon. So, yeah, we put your seatbelt on and get ready to go. It's going to be nine hours and counting. You guys, excuse me, I'm trying to figure out how to use this iPad and not let it use me. There we go. Yeah, you know how that goes. All right, so anyway, uh, that's me. And let's look at that video before we get into the sermon, amen? Even as a kid, growing up, we were poor. We weren't even poor, we were poor. <laughs> we couldn't afford the other letters, man. We had no money. Look, I was actually being sponsored by a family from Haiti. <laughs> yeah, that's a funny joke. <laughs> I see this lady over here struggling. She don't know if she should laugh or not. Like, <laughs> <laughs> when you're poor, your creativity excels. Like it really, really excels. I remember I wanted an action figure when I was 10 years old. I wanted an action figure so bad. My birthday came along, my dad hands me a box. I open it up, it's empty. He said, it's Invisible Man. I was like, that is awesome. I played with that thing for like three weeks, man. So my brother hid it from me. I couldn't find it nowhere, man. I knew he took it. We played games, we just made up games. We played this one game called uh, Talk About You. The instructions were to just talk about you. That's all we did, we talked about each other. My friends would talk about me, and be like, Michael Jr., you got some big feet. And I was good at this game. I was like, oh yeah, well you so dark skinned, I bet if you ride a motorcycle, you get a ticket for tenant windows. <laughs> it's hilarious. White people are looking for black people to make sure they can laugh. Is this okay? <laughs> yeah, it's okay? You sure? No? Yeah. <laughs> we ain't had no money, man. We had a my parents would buy us some stuff, but they couldn't pay for every like we had the game operation, right? We ain't had no batteries. Then my cousin came over and he figured out a way how to plug it into the wall, right? It's a whole nother game now. What's that have to do with church? No, it has something to do with church. He talks about being good up poor, right? Good up with hard times. And, and that, that can be funny, you can make jokes about that looking back. But nobody likes to go through hard times. And trust me, when you're going through them, it's not that easy to crack jokes. Right, when you're playing with Invisible Man as a kid, that's just sure went all that funny, right? Okay, and so no one likes to go through hard times. You know, there's a, the name of the sermon today is Remember My Chance. And it's a verse that we're gonna read in a second in Colossians chapter four that kind of stood out to me in my quiet times uh, last week. But if you had to think, if you read the Bible, if you had to think through what is your favorite, uh, let's take Jesus out of the picture, okay? Because who's your favorite Bible person? Like, who, who do you want to be like? Who, who inspires you the most? Think about it for a second. If you, if you read the Bible, is it something, did, did that name come to your head? 
Now, I, I know Pastor the mic around, but because of time, I'm not going to do that. Anybody want to share the name real loudly? Gideon. Gideon, okay. Anybody else? What you got? Paul. Paul, okay. Hey. Abraham, all right. David. David. Joseph. Peter, Peter okay. Anybody else? Moses. Yeah. Elisha. Elisha or Elijah? Sha. Sha, okay. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Moses. Moses. Y you know who I've never heard in an audience? And I've done this with big audiences and small audiences. No one ever says Joe. <laughs> Nobody ever says, man, who I want to be like is Joe. Because Joe didn't want to be Joe. Because he wrote this letter and also the letter of Philippians. 
while he was in chain in this house of mess. Now he had other other times in the jail and it got a lot less pretty. Right? right. Come on. But this is why he was in the house of mess. Remember my chains. Why would he write that letter? Why would he write or finish his letter that way? Well, I'm glad you asked. And that's what brings us to this sermon. A couple things about chains. First thing, let's lie. Everybody has them. Right. It, now, everybody didn't get arrested in a house arrest. But obviously, Paul did not. He was a very educated man, very successful in his career before becoming a, 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 a minister of the gospel. He did not aspire as a young man to be imprisoned. Right. To be beaten, to be persecuted, right? This was a hardship for him. Right? This was a trial for him. This was, this, this was hard. Everybody has hard times. Everybody has these struggles that are, are lonely. Now, we all have problems. But I'm talking about problems where you're alone in the problem. And even when you have friends that care about you, they really can't relate. Like some things, some journeys, some struggles, some hurts, some loss, some pain, you've got to go through alone. Even when you're in a room, you're alone. Yeah. Even when you're talking about it, you're, they, they, they can't experience your pain or carry your pain or carry what you are enduring. Some things you endure in life, and maybe you've gone through some, or maybe you haven't. If you live a while, you have. Man, they're just so hard. We, we all have chains. Sometimes the chain is self-inflicted. It's sin. You know, we're dealing with the consequences of sexual morality. We're dealing with the consequences of lying. The consequences of being unfaithful in marriage. The consequences of our anger, of our, of, 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 of our, of our pride, of our arrogance. The consequences of pornography, the consequences of a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction, and and, and so the, the, the addiction itself is a chain. The 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 because because all sin is addictive, right? Right. But the consequences, like us, we're mad at God because the consequences of all sin. Mm -hmm. And we're mad. Why, why did they go through this? Well, if he hadn't robbed the bank, <laughs> why does it always happen to me? Well, it, you know. The police can't answer you because you robbed the bank. Hello. If it hadn't, she doing that girl, she wouldn't have shot you. And you, and you pick each other. You know, but the, the consequences. And sometimes, sometimes the, the, the pain is self-inflicted. Sometimes it's health. Sometimes it's finances. Sometimes it's finances and health. Sometimes it's it's a relationship, and, and, and nobody's perfect. But sometimes it's not it's not anything you could have done. It's the, it's the other person wilding out, right? So, so sometimes it's it, it's it's job problems, financial problems, life problems. Sometimes it's being mistreated by somebody, being hurt, being let down, being being abandoned, uh, uh, someone betraying you that you're close to. There's a whole lot of ways that we endure things. Sometimes it's just loss. Losing someone that we're close to. And you're in the middle of it, and people are telling you comforting words, and you can't even hear them. Yes, Everybody endures chains. Everybody gets locked up in a house arrest. That was Paul's burden to bear. But everyone endures chains. Why is it important to remember his chains? To remember other people's chains and to remember our own. That's the question of the hour. Next slide. We all need some help along the way. I'll start with the most obvious reason why this verse is in the Bible first. And you know, I went, this, like I said, this, this verse troubled me, so I went to the commentaries to read what scholars said about it. And scholars were all over the map about it. And I think, I think commentaries are very helpful. One of the things that, that strikes me, though, about really smart people is sometimes we, we, people can complicate things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I think sometimes we're looking for the answer when it's more, more layered than that. The way people work and the way spirit works is I, I, my personal convictions a lot of times are not an answer. That the answer has layers to it. 
And you think about your own speech. Why do you say something or uh, in something a certain way? A lot of times there are layers to it, right? So that's not just one reason. But the most obvious one that a lot of people said is he wanted people to know he was in chains and think about it. They needed help. He wanted prayers. He, he wanted company. He wanted people to come visit him, right? And, and, and whatever. He wanted the church to be mindful of his struggles. And one of the things you notice about Paul when he was in prison, when he was sick, when he went through hardships, he wanted the church to pray for him, to pray for boldness, to pray that he could endure, to pray that he would be faithful. So the, the most obvious thing is he wanted them to keep in mind. Hey, don't forget about me. I'm not too proud to ask for your prayers. I'm not too proud to ask for your help. I'm, I'm not too so contained. The mighty apostle Paul, too proud to let you know that I'm struggling. That this is hard. That even while I'm writing to you, I'm, I'm reminded that I'm not a free man. And I've done nothing wrong. The most obvious reason is that we all need help. All of us need help. And the, and the question is, when we need help spiritually, emotionally, do we let people help us? Are we honest and vulnerable and humble enough to let people help us? So yeah, I said something you got to carry along. You got to carry along in that it's your journey. But it doesn't mean you don't need help. No one can sit in that prison for him, right? But it doesn't mean he didn't he didn't want someone to keep him company sometimes. It didn't mean he didn't want letters written to him to encourage him. It didn't mean he didn't, he didn't want to know, be comforted that people were praying for him. It, 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 it didn't mean that he wanted to, 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 to be an island to himself. We all need help. That's right. Come on, Frank. Man, if you're married today, you know you need help. <laughs> you need all sorts of help, right? And sometimes we sit in it, right? Have you ever sat in something? Then you go on the marriage thing and you're sitting in it and it's not going well. And then you're like mad at people for not helping you, but you haven't told them what's going on. Yeah. Mad at people for reaching out, reaching out to you, but yeah, you haven't you said, they didn't know what's happening, y'all. So you're like, man, you look at me like you just, you're just mad at people, like, and you because you go on through stuff, but you're not open or vulnerable or humble about how so I ask you it's going okay. No, it's not. If you're married, you know. You need help. You may have thought you were spiritual before you got married. And men, we're so thick. We, uh, women, we think we have it all together. We think we're smart. We think we're intelligent. We think we got some swag to us. And then we get married, we're like, we got, we got, we, we, you just burst all of us. And all sorts of things get exposed, right? We know we need help. Do we get help? Do we let people in and let people help us to what we need to? Man, if you're single, you know you got issues. You got all sorts of issues. Your issues have issues. <laughs> uh, are you humble enough to let people help you? And are you loving enough to extend the help? So we all need help along the way. Come on, sir. Come on, we man. all need to remember our chains, the people to be praying for us, people to help us, to counsel us, to encourage, to encourage us when we're going through a hard time, when, when, when we're lonely, when, 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 we, when, we, when we stumble, when we fall, when we feel vulnerable, when we get let down. The most obvious reasons why, reason why he said it is that he was not too proud to seek help. And I think that's true. I don't think it's all of it. He had mentioned he was in chains in verse 3. They all knew he was in prison. It wasn't like he needed to end the letter that way. It's not my opinion. But I think that's a part of it. What else is going on? Next slide. Your pain has a purpose. So in Romans chapter 5, we're going to be verses 1 to 5. That's the next slide after that. 
Romans 5, 1 to 5. Just as this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Pain has a purpose. It has a purpose. In fact, I'm, I'm going to break down three things that pain does, always. You know, it's funny reading commentaries or, or sermons. Of, I, I watched a piece, piece of a couple of sermons yesterday and some commentaries on this. You get a lot of insight, a lot of truth. You get a lot of misconceptions about people. Americans have a very interesting approach to suffering. We, we are like the only country that believes we shouldn't suffer. The whole world has embraced the fact that life's hard. So for America, we think life should not be hard. In fact, you know, we have a hard time going to heaven because we really want to make heaven right here. And we expect it to be heaven. And we resent life for being hard. We resent that life would dare to be hard for an American. We are stunned when things happen to us. They're happening all over the world, but not here. This is America. Right? And we shouldn't struggle in America. Life should be good to us. And so a lot of the, the spiritual approaches to it from ministers is from an American perspective. Right. And they're like, oh, they're going through hard times. God is disciplining you and he's punishing you and he's but it's, it's always it's always about sin. And I'm thinking that that's not that's not in line with the Bible. That's the opposite of the book of Job. That's the opposite of John. But that implies that we shouldn't struggle. That's the opposite of, of Paul's experience. That's the opposite of Jesus' experience. That's just a very American approach to the Bible. You shouldn't suffer. No, suffering is life. It always does three things. It marks us. It shapes us. And it defines us. It marks us, it shapes us, and it defines us. How, how does it mark us? It marks us as being his, as being Christ. If we don't suffer, it says, let me go back to the verse. I'm trying to master the, the art of the iPad, so be with me. Uh, now, so we also glory in our sufferings because we know the suffering is perseverance. He goes on. But... There's a part of it, of the suffering, that links us to Christ. There's a part of, it's, look here again, you suffer whether you're Christian or non Christian. You suffer whether you're spiritual or non spiritual. But suffering righteously, suffering and not losing your faith, suffering and not losing your joy. Suffering and not losing your hope in heaven. It, 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 is, it is one of the defining characteristics of a disciple is that we suffer like Christ suffers. And there's no greater testimony to the cross in Paul than Paul and James. There's no greater mark to the Holy Spirit working in Paul than Paul and James. To the glory of God, it, 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 so many people's lives were, had, he had an impact because he would, how he endured James. It marks you as his when you can suffer in faith and endure and not waver in your conviction. It marks us. It marks us. It shapes us. How's it shape us? Well, the pastor tells us. It says that suffering 
produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope is not put us to shame. And it goes on. It says that, and here again, suffering doesn't produce these things. Suffering in faith produces these things. You can suffer and it can make you bitter and angry and nasty, right? You can suffer and, and you can lose your faith and lose your friends. That, that, you know, suffering in itself, suffering is, is, is pressure. Pressure busts the pipe. Right? Let me, let me go back. There was an analogy I wanted to share that I wanted to share before I move on. About the, about the marketing part. We, we're some athletes here, right? Any, any football players? People play football in high school or college? Raise your hand high. Football players are all about the, 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 the scars, I think. Especially defensive players, man. You're all about, man, y'all play football, so, so let me show you the scar I have. Let me show you whatever. It's like there, there are defining marks that put you in fraternity. I mean, the NFL guys are the worst, man. They'll be on the NFL network, man, and they'll show their fingers going sideways. It's like a badge of honor. It's like a defining mark of who you are and what you've done. It's like, man, this, this sums up what I sacrificed for this sport. This sums up how much I love this sport, right? Our, our ability to suffer for the glory of God is a mark that sums up your Christian life. Let me go on to how, to how it shapes us. When you have faith, it says, and you suffer, you were praying to be patient. You were praying for, you know, perseverance. It says, well, oh, you want perseverance? Here's some suffering. Here's some suffering. Well, I didn't pray for suffering. You want perseverance. If you will apply faith to your suffering, you'll get perseverance. If you don't have faith, you won't get something, something else. Faith the ingredient you got put in the mix. Okay, why well, I, okay, I don't know. I want, I want better character. I need more character. My girlfriend's saying I need more character. My yes needs to be yes, my no needs to be no. I need to be a man of integrity. God, I pray to be a man of integrity. I pray to be a man that can weather the storms. I want to be a man that can be a great husband, great father one day. I want to be a head of a house. I want to be someone that can make an impact in the church and make a difference in the world. I want to be a woman of integrity that changes the world. Oh, you want integrity and character. Here's some stuff. Faith to suffering. That makes perseverance. Add perseverance to faith. That makes count. Ain't no shortcuts. Well, I don't want to suffer. Then you want to be weak. Come on, Frank. You will not leave your mark on this world until God leaves a mark on you. We, we don't want it. And we fight it. And sometimes we suffer through things as I call it wasted suffering. Because we didn't bring faith. We just had, we just had a lot of pain. We brought bad attitudes and, 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 and nasty results, right? Well, that's, a waste of, that's a waste of good pain.
they see the way that I, I have faithfully embraced my situation. And it gives them confidence. They see the impact I'm having on the palace cars. In other words, he's having an impact on, on, on the people that are in prison. Because it's clear to them that he's, he, he's there for Christ because there's so much Christ in him. Rather than what was me, he's like, man, he's, he's been a great example. And so, the mark of Christ is on him. Right? And he's shaped through the furnace of his suffering. And so, he's, he's inspiring people. He's inspiring faith. He's changing lives by what he endures. So much so that the disciples in the region are inspired because of his chains. And there's nothing, no sermon that Paul would have preached. Nothing that he could have done that would have inspired as many people as his chains. Remember my chains, yes, it's about I need help. It's about remembering who I stand for and what God is doing in me despite my circumstance. And let it give hope for you to see God use you as well. So many things that we, that we complain about are the very things that God will use to save somebody else. Either by our example of how we deal with suffering or the lessons that we learn down the road that we'll pass on to somebody else. You know, with the single people met, I give a lot of dating advice. And is that, that's because Michelle and I dated and we did such a great job. Well, I mean, we did date and a lot of things went well in that situation. But a lot of my advice goes to the, the, the two previous relations I had as a Christian that were disasters. Well, I did everything wrong. And I suffered as a result of what I did wrong. But I kept the faith in my suffering. I repented of my sins and what people benefit as a result of what I had to do. Chains change lives. If we will embrace faith, now look, I'm, we're not praying to suffer. You know, we get that. We all want to get through the storm. Paul was trying to get out of prison, by the way. But he embraced while he was there that he was going to glorify Christ in his situation. And they marked him, they shaped him, and they defined his legacy. And so much of his legacy is how he handled imprisonment and execution. So much of the legacy of Christ is how he handled the cross. And we're not different. You know, my life has been changed by a lot of things. But when I think about the defining moments, certainly one was becoming a Christian. But I feel like my second conversion happened, um, I don't know, about six months, seven months. If my first year of being sick, I was bedridden. I was completely bedridden after a few months of getting sicker every month. Going to test after test, doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. We had no idea what was wrong or how we were treated. We lived in New York City. Uh, I got sick four months after Jacqueline was born. So we had a newborn, we had a child less than one year, a bedridden husband, Michelle losing her mind. It was a really bad situation. And so you got, you got the I've been struggling with health this summer, but this is self-induced. In other words, this summer was kind of a planned thing. It's, it's gone a lot longer than planned. Uh, it's a treatment that leads to illness. And the other side of that treatment should be great health. So we kind of plan to take the summer, hopefully the initial was a month out of the summer, to kind of get my health together, to have a great run. Last time I did this treatment, I was totally healthy for three and a half years, three years, which is great. So we're hoping for another window where I'm totally healthy for three years, right? But we had to endure it. It's taking longer, but that's a planned thing, right? Where you can kind of see, okay, the, take, you take this treatment and you get here, and I just gotta endure this for a period of time. That wasn't what happened way back when. I was sick, we didn't know what was going on. When we, when I finally got a doctor that can somewhat treat it. He said, Frank, you would, you would, you would be dead in a couple of years. 
dangerous and lethal. We don't pay any loans. You die. This is killing you. It's choking out your cervical area, your nervous system. You, 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 this, this is killing you, right? Well, this is a few months before that diagnosis. I'm sick. You know, this I got sick, and it's like, first off, the church is great. And the church did a great job of doing this and suffering. And people go on through stuff, man, for about 29 days. And the first 29 days is amazing. And then day 30, you got they got to move on with their lives. And you gotta move on with yours. And, and I don't say that to criticize the church. Yeah, we can do a better job of remembering people. In fact, we need to do a better job of remembering people that go through long-term stuff. But there is a sense, though, too, there's other stuff going on, right? And when you're going through stuff, people will never be able to give you as much attention as you feel like you deserve in that situation. So, you know, initially I'm full of hope because I'm thinking, man, whatever it is, the doctor will figure it out. And God is going to be sick. You know, I'm young. I, 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 I remember going to a doctor appointment, and I'm getting test after test. I'm going to specialist after specialist. Now, I'll never forget the appointment I went to where the doctor said, uh, Frank, this test is negative. If you've ever been in this situation, it's a really weird place to be because you, you actually go hoping the test is positive, no matter what the test is for. I mean, I got MRIs and CAT scans, I got tests for, for, for HIV, and, and after a while, you, 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 you're, you're praying for a positive result. That, that, that may seem really weird, but, but it's like the not knowing is worse than knowing. It's like, so, so, so if they said, oh, try the HIV test was negative, you're like, oh, man. You know, it's like, you, and you're like, oh. but you, you really leave and say, we didn't find any tumors in your brain. It's messed up, but it's true, right? right. Because at least there's a next step, there's a treatment, like, you know, whatever, there's something to fight. So we, we run all these different tests. I, I go there and says, this test is negative. I says, what's next? He says, there are no more tests. Wow. What? There are no more tests. That's when the anger and the depression and the resentment set in. That's when it set in, you know, man, I wasn't adding faith to suffering, I was a sufferer. I was adding bitterness to it, anger to it, all sorts of, I went to a very, very dark place. I was angry at everybody, and really, I was angry at everyone because I was really angry at God. How could God do, God, I gave up everything to serve you. I gave, up, I gave up a law career. I gave, I gave up everything I would want. I went, I went to Africa. I did everything to serve you, and this is my life. Such a dark place. And no, it's talking about, about all my friends that moved on without me. I was in such a dark, dark place. And I would have lost everything. I would have been bitter or alone or taken my life. It wasn't going to end well, but whatever was going to happen. I'll never forget, I knew one person, I've told the story before about tell the day I died. One person I died knew personally that was sicker than I was. And it was Donna Cunningham, a good, a good friend of my wife that my wife had baptized many years earlier. And she was a real good friend to us and one of our matchmakers along the way. And uh, she got really sick. Uh, when we were dating, in fact, we got a phone call when we were uh, on our honeymoon that she was going to die. That she wouldn't make it before until we got back. And of course she made it. And she hung on, and so this is a year after that, she's still, you know, I'm sorry, this is, but after come back, this is about three years later. And she's still kicking. And John is about this thick. And totally bedridden, and been that way for a few years. Supposed to, every time they say she's going to die, she kept on sticking stick in there, right? And if anybody had a reason to be bitter, 
to be angry, to be into herself, it would have been done. People could say, Frank, be faithful, but they've never been through it. It's going to be okay. You don't even know what I'm going through. But Donna. So Donna started calling me up out the blue, asking me what she could pray for me about, what she could do for me. This thing. Literally a, a living skeleton. Using all her day's energy to pray for me. I knew how hard it was for her to dial a phone number. How painful it was for her to dial seven digits. Wow. And she would take the, her energy, expand her life essence to shake her chains and inspire me. And I would hang up the phone and weep. Because she showed me where I was and showed me who I wanted to be. And I feel like in so many ways it's my second conversion. Because she inspired me and she didn't want to preach to me, just, to, just calling me, inspired me to add faith to the suffering. Yeah. To trust God through the suffering. To stop pulling the chains and stop riding with the chains. First book I ever wrote, I wrote while I was better than that. Largely inspired by her. I could only concentrate for, for like an hour or a day. I would write from like two to three in the morning and then go back to bed. But I thought, I, I, I gotta find a way to inspire people with what strength I have. I started doing one in the morning Bible studies with people because there's one time I could sit up. I started thinking who I could call and encourage and help. I, I, I put the word, anybody that wants help, Come, come at 12, 31 in the morning, I'll give it to you for an hour. We start going on a midnight dates, trying to figure out how to be married. Rather than complaining about my wife, not understanding my problem, trying to be a husband and go out. We go to one in the morning dates, midnight. It's New York City, something's open, okay? We actually went to the movies at 12, 30 at night. What's Donna's legacy? Donna saved my life because of her chains. Remember her chains. I, I, I don't walk around one day and I remember her chains. I know she didn't want to be Joe or Joe Betta. She saved my soul and inspired my life in the course of it. How I handle adversity, how, whether it's mine or my daughter's or whatever, is largely inspired by those phone calls. And I would like to say she'll never know, but she'll know because I'll tell her when I see her. The defining legacy of remembering someone's shit. So I want to encourage you today, no matter what you're going through, let your challenges mark you, shape you, and define you. Find strength in the, in the faithful challenges of God's faithful servants. Find role models of how people are inspired and inspire other people. And let's be a living testimony to God through good times and bad. And the God be the Lord.
Help us to hold on to the cross. We pray all this in your name. Son, Lord Jesus Christ.